Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. My name is uh, Dominic Hardy. I am Public Programs Officer in the Education and Community Programs Department here at the museum. Delighted to have you with us today as the inaugural lecture of the seventh annual series given by Dr. François Marc Gagnon, Director of the Gale and Stephen A. Jaroslawski Institute for Studies in Canadian Art at Concordia University. In this respect, I'd like to extend a special welcome to the Concordia students here present today. We very much hope that you will enjoy the series. Of course, it's part of your path through the university curriculum, but also that you'll enjoy the museum and use our resources as much as you can uh, throughout your studies. Thanks also to Denis Longchamp at the Institute and to the Department of Art History and its chair, Dr. Lauren Lerner, for enabling the series to take place in connection with the department's academic program. As always, we at the museum thank René Malo and Marie Gagnon for their constant support of all the museum's cultural activities. François-Marc Gagnon is known worldwide as an exceptional scholar whose work has been vital to the study of Canadian visual culture. Recipient of the Governor General's Award in 1978 for his biography of Paul-Émile Bordua, honored with the Order of Canada in 1999, he is teacher, scholar, author, as well as renowned lecturer, taking up the leadership of the Institute after a distinguished career teaching at the Université de Montréal. His writings are legion, covering subjects that range from the imagery of the time of Jacques Cartier to contemporary art in Quebec, and they have pride of place in the historiography of Canadian and Quebec art. He is a member of many museum committees, including our own, and is sought, is sought after as an expert by numerous artistic and academic bodies. And it's opportune to note today as the meetings of ACFAS, the Association Francophone pour le Savoir, are taking place this week in Quebec City in honor of its 400th anniversary, that Dr. Gagnon was last fall's recipient of the ACFAS's André Laurando Prize, named for another outstanding humanist who has influenced the evolution of the society towards greater understanding of its many faceted cultural identities. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our friend, François-Marc Gagnon. Good afternoon. Uh, this year, we, we didn't have at the museum a kind of a very significant Canadian art exhibition like we had with the Midi Car last year or even with Holgate. So I decided to, to take a subject matter that will be more, not, less linked to actuality, if you want, and more uh, broad. And I thought uh, of stage of life, so you will see what I mean by that. See, Maybe it's a, it's a problem that begins to bug me a little bit uh, with, <laughs> with my age. But uh, it's, the, uh, it's how we have represented or depicted, if you want, the um, ch children and adult and uh, old age in Canadian art. And uh, I will take uh, a very broad perspective, meaning Canadian art uh, from the beginning, if you want, to, to today. And uh, today we will begin by uh, uh, the first thing, childhood. I will uh, devote two lectures to, to this theme uh, because uh, today I will rather uh, uh, just cover, let's say, the very early uh, works in New France and, and uh, really, really the, the very beginning of it. And uh, if you want to... to uh, generalize and to try to see how it was, how it evolved the uh, representation of, of, of children in particular, I think we can speak of a lengthy process of secularization of the team. When we start, uh, the, the child is completely immersed in a religious context. Uh, uh, let's say the, uh, the representation not only of uh, the Holy Family, in which you will have uh, the infant Jesus, but also even, you will see the example I will give you, when they are depicting children 
I would say, <laughs> normal condition, they are very often represented in uh, churches and kneeling on their knees and things like that. So really, at the beginning, we have the impression that uh, you, you cannot define a, a child portrait, let's say, except inside of this religious context. No? There's one exception, and very often, the uh, exception confirm la règle, like we say in French, the, uh, it is the representation of First Nation children because, of course, they are um, not Christian and with them you have uh, other problems because you cannot represent them in a religious context so you don't know too much how, how, how to represent them. And uh, we will, I will give you a few examples of uh, this type of representation. Uh, uh, going back very, very far in time, in fact, the first example, it will be a, a depiction of Inuit uh, family, let's say, the mother and, and the child and a daughter. And uh, what you see there is a kind of broadsheet that was uh, uh, the purpose of, of which was to announce uh, the display of these people in different cities. Uh, so they were uh, caught, of course, in uh, America, in Labrador, in fact, and brought in Europe. And then they were like uh, presented like in a freak show to, uh, from one place to the other. They come to see uh, wild people from America and, and things like that. The text that accompanied it is in German, but uh, that means that it was presented in Nuremberg and also um, in different cities in, uh, in Germany. But uh, the text is very interesting because it shows uh, the perception of the European of these people on one hand, and also the very, very barbarous type of, uh, of uh, dealing with, with the First Nation people that they met here. Uh, uh, I will, I will uh, read to you a translation of, of the text and comment it here and there, and you will see, uh, uh, I think it, it, it's very eloquent by itself. So the title on the top says, True Portrait of, Sa of a Savage Woman, of course. Huh? They, they, they use the, the word savage or wild or, or uh, uh, with her little daughter found in a district called Nova Terra. Huh? They, they don't know how to call it because this, this thing is 1566. Huh? So it's really the very, very early depiction, maybe one of the first depictions of Inuit people ever known. And uh, Terra, uh, Nova Terra, meaning uh, what we will call today Labrador, and brought to Antwerp, uh, so brought in Europe, and recently publicly seen there and still to be seen. Uh, in this year, 1566, then the text goes on, there arrived at Antwerp by ship from Zealand, a savage woman, a small person, together with her little daughter, and she's shape and cloth as this picture shows and was found in Terra Nova, which is a new district first discovered by the French and the Portuguese a few years ago. And this woman with her husband and little child were met by the French who had voyaged to this district and come ashore and sought wonderful thing. And the husband was shot through his body with an arrow. Already, uh, you see the, the context in which this first encounter was done was not friendly, uh, it was really, uh, uh, a kind of fi a fight between uh, between French and and uh, these people. However, he will not surrender. Meaning, the husband will not surrender. As if it's so strange, you know, that he defend his family anyway. He will not surrender, but took his stand bravely to defend himself. And in this skirmish, he was severely wounded in the side by another Frenchman with a sword. Then he took. Uh, his own blood from his side in his hand and lick it out of his hand and took his stand to defend himself still more fiercely than before. Finally, he was struck and wounded in his throat so severely that he fell to the ground and died from his wound. This man was 12 feet high. Ah. <laughs> then suddenly we, we get into a more uh, fantastic time. 12 feet tall, and have in 12 days killed 11 people with his own hand, Frenchmen and Portuguese, in order to eat them um, because they like to eat uh, no flesh better than human flesh. 
how they know that, I don't know. Uh, so th this is very, very typical of, of this type of text in which it, you have uh, suddenly an amplification of, of uh, this man who defend himself as, as, as he could, you know, uh, against uh, a bunch of uh, enemy, uh, is suddenly seen as a kind of a dangerous giant, you see, 12 feet high, and also as an anthropophage. Huh? And uh, this, this idea that the others is a cannibal, <laughs> it's always the other. I think if ever you can put your, your hand on this book by William Harris, who, who is uh, called The Man-Eating Myth. Huh? And Harris tells the story that the first encounter he had of cannibalism himself was in Africa. And uh, the, uh, the people he met there accused the European to be the cannibal. Huh? He says, uh, our dear friend, uh, uh, let's say John, went to Europe, and we never hear from him since. So you probably have eaten him. Huh? And, and he says, OK, it's, it's always the same, same uh, type of approach. It is the other who is cannibalistic. And there, of course, they have no idea of what they are speaking because they, they didn't know the language. They, they were there just to, to fight on, on, the, on the beach there and to try to take this woman with them. And, and, uh, and uh, so how can they even suspect that? See? Then I, I continue the text. And as they seized the woman, she took her stand as if she were completely raving and mad because of her child whom she will have to leave behind when the sailors took her away to the ship, as though she will rather lose her life than leave her child behind. What is so strange in her behavior, you know? If, if it was European who were attacked the, the same way, will not uh, the mother will do exactly like this one? Huh? And, uh, but no, she, since they are savage people and, uh, and the wild, they, they must be uh, mad, you know, to, to defend themselves. Then he continued. Because she was so mad, they let her alone a bit. She went to the spot where she had concealed her child. Then she was calmer than before. Then they took the woman with her child and brought her away. And none of the Frenchmen could understand a single word of hers or speaks with her at all. V very often also, they brought on these ships with them, and it's through all, already with Christopher Columbus, people who spoke Arabic. Why? Because you are in Asia. Uh, when you come to America in 1566, you are discovering the uh, outmost uh, of Asia. And then normally, uh, the language you associate with Asia is Arabic. Uh, and uh, they, for instance, uh, uh, Christophe, Christopher Columbus says, uh, I get dressed beautifully and all that, and because I want to meet the, the Grand Khan. Uh, and uh, he, he was a little bit surprised because he says we, the only thing we saw it was naked people uh, running here and there. He says, where is the, the, the pagoda? Where is the, the temple or, the, or the, uh, the, the retinue of this great king and all that? But he had with him two, two guys. One, one was speaking Hebrew and the other was speaking Arabic. And so they try to shalom. Uh, doesn't work, Salem, it doesn't work either. And, and here also is the same thing. It says it's a language so strange that we, we cannot even understand it. Huh? Nevertheless, they know that they eat uh, people. Huh? But she was taught enough in eight months that it was known that she had eaten many men. You see? And this is a, a way to get your information. You see, you, you teach the language, and then you, you get them to say whatever, whatever you want. Huh? Her clothing is made of seal skin in the manner shown by this picture. The paint marks, uh, watch that, it's incredible. The paint marks she has on her face are entirely blue. Huh? It means the tattoo uh, that she has on her face are entirely blue, like sky blue. And these the husband makes on his wife when he takes her for his wife so that he can recognize her by them, for otherwise they run among one another like beasts. That's it's incredible, <laughs> again, this idea that you recognize your wife just by her tattoo, you know, because they, don't, they, uh, they all look alike, eh? so you, you need a distinctive sign. Huh? And it's, it's one of the rare justification of tattooing that I find <laughs> in history, that uh, it's to recognize your wife. 
and the marks cannot be taken off again with any substance. These marks are made with the juice of a plant which grow in the country. Her body is yellow-brown like the half moors. The woman was 20 years old when she was captured in the year of uh, 66 in August, the child seven years. And then the finale, you know, the, the last paragraph, you will see uh, uh, how we, yeah, yeah, this man, the, the guy who writes that, have no problem with, <laughs> with guilt. <laughs> he said, let us thank God Almighty for his blessings that he has enlightened us with his words so that we are not such savages people and many eaters as are this district. That this woman was captured and brought out of there since she knows nothing of the true God but lives almost more wickedly than the beast. Uh, God grant that she be converted to acknowledge him. I, amen. Uh, so uh, finally, see, there, there's no, no problem. See, uh, uh, thanks God that we are not savages uh, like uh, these man eating people. Uh, uh, I, thought, I thought this is uh, uh, very typical of uh, the, these first encounter. Instead of being, uh, say, friendly or a little bit prudent, that right away you are in a context of, of fights. And also, the, what was the purpose to bring this woman uh, in Europe, except to show her like a curiosity, you see, like so, something that was very unusual, and try to make money with that. There, there's a, another uh, example of that by um, a drawing done by John White. Huh? So this is linked rather to the Frobisher uh, expedition. It's a little bit later in time, 1577, and uh, it represents uh, an Inuit woman and with her child. I think you see it in the in her in her hood uh, in the back. A little baby. We we see his hand and we see his little face. Huh? And uh, John White possibly have made the trip with with them with Frobisher and. Uh, because uh, Frobisher made two uh, principal trips in, in Canada, let's say in, in, the, in the north. And uh, yeah, one was uh, where they lost some people, and they were told also that um, there is some gold mine there that it could be fantastic too. So he came back for two reasons to, to uh, try to, to find the people that he lost uh, on the first expedition, and also to bring back this uh, famous uh, full gold, in fact. Uh, it's a pyrite uh, the, 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 that looks uh, like gold, but it's, uh, it's nothing. And uh, it's possible that uh, John White was on this expedition, but it's also possible that he saw this woman on her way back in Bristol, for instance, or in England, any place where, where the uh, ex ex expedition finished. And, uh, one little detail which is strange, it is that you see her uh, navel. Uh, and normally with, um, with this type of suit in um, seal skin, you, you cannot see that. Uh, so we suspect that he probably painted her naked and then had the costume uh, uh, separately and then had it to, uh, to the picture. Uh, uh, the costume, mind, mind you, is, seems very genuine. Uh, that, that what we know of uh, the, the way they, they were dressed, it seems uh, very, uh, very close to, to what is really possible. Huh? And, uh, and for instance, I have a, a more uh, recent uh, uh, witness of that with this expedition of Stephenson, uh, like in, in the beginning of this century, of, of the uh, 20th century. Inuit woman and child, and you see it's exactly the same type of uh, presentation, as if also the, uh, the style uh, have not changed much in their costume, in their way to, to, to behave. Huh? Okay, so that's a first example, of, I said, of a non-religious uh, picture of children, huh? because it deals with the First Nation. So, second example, I want to give you, again, of this uh, representation of native people, it is <coughs> uh, now not of Inuit, but uh, of uh, Amerindian, like, uh, like what we see here is a map 
by Samuel de Champlain. Although we speak a lot of Champlain uh, this year because of the, uh, the foundation of uh, Quebec City. And uh, this is one of his principal map of 1612. It's very beautiful, uh, illustrated and all that. And you recognize maybe on the right, the uh, St. Lawrence, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the, uh, the island of, uh, of Newfoundland, maybe uh, places where we, we don't expect it. And then it finished with, with a sea uh, in which uh, we, we probably are in India. Champlain has this marvelous idea. He says, if we could have a, a, a post in Quebec City where we will stop all the, the, the boats who are going to China, huh? and we will tax them on the way. It's a, it's a, it's a very good <laughs> idea. But, so that's why I think the, the, the Great Lake there is like uh, left open a little bit. Okay, the, the, the section I want to attract your attention on is this one, uh, who was, uh, if you noticed, the, on the left side of the map. It's a representation of uh, four <coughs> Amerindian, figure de Montagnet and figure de Sauvage Almouchiqua. <coughs> the Montagnet, we, we still uh, call, we call them to the Inu, but, but they, it's still a, a name that we use. Almouchiqua, no. Uh, it, the, these were people living on the coast of the Atlantic coast and were much more, uh, let's say, uh, advanced in terms of culture. See, that's why he saw uh, the woman holding plants uh, and probably a squash in one hand. And the other thing who looks like a tulip, I don't know what, it's, uh, it's maize, uh, it's corn. And uh, because these are the two uh, principal food uh, that they were using. And the man have, uh, if you isolate the head, it, it could look like uh, Henry IV or something like that. So they, that means they don't have the concept of racial uh, representation at the time. Minute, they, they had another system which was not much better, in which you, you put in a hierarchy uh, all the people. Uh, you put the king or the pope at the top, and then the noble, the, uh, the noble and then the bourgeois, and then the poor, and then the savage, huh? and then the animal. Huh? They, they are really at the limit between the two, uh, the two sections. And uh, the, uh, the representation of the Montagnier woman uh, with, uh, these people are more nomadic, so that's why she has a, a horn in her hand, and probably a representation, of, a miniature representation of a canoe behind her. And uh, she's presented there with a child. Uh, and to my surprise, I saw it here, and then we saw it in another book of Champlain, except that in the second book, she's a Huron. Uh, as if oh, Montagne, Huron, it's all the same. They, there's no, no, not too much to... So they use the same type of uh, picture. That's, that's why, of course, it's the, the picture is reversed. Uh, when you have an engraving, you, you copy what you see, but when you print it, of course, it's reversed. And uh, so then uh, it's interesting to put them in parallel. Because if you look at the left uh, figure, the one who was on the map, it's hard to understand how this child could not slip away uh, where he is and fall on the ground. Uh, because the, the woman hold him just like that, unless he has a very good grip uh, on the breast, but uh, anyway, it, it seems uh, almost impossible uh, to, to show that. And I think the other one, the Euron representation, I've tried to correct it a little bit by uh, presenting the child like uh, in a sack. Uh, he's not, uh, he's not uh, free like this and falling, falling apart. And uh, you have to modify the costume because of that in the two cases. And uh, that was uh, the solution of that. So they were fascinated by the way the, uh, these people were holding their children, because of course they have nothing to do with what uh, they were doing in France. And uh, so when they represent mother with child, it's very often with this type of preoccupation, say, how, how these people were, were doing. And uh, in fact, what we have um, uh, tried to reconstruct here, uh, this is Marc Laberge, uh, uh, a guy who, who created a, a company of illustration, which is called the Vid Vidanthrop, Videoanthrop. 
and uh, he is very often consulted also by a filmmaker who wants to show uh, Indians in the past and things like that. So, so he says, in fact, what, what was the costume that he tried to express in Champlain, it was probably closer to the, to the one I show you here. And he quotes a Jesuit who describe more uh, this type of costume in, in a more uh, interesting way. He says, in France, men and women have their clothes made rather tight-fitting in order to impart a lighter appearance, the girls especially priding themselves on their slenderness. In Canada, everyone dress so as to look large, both men and women wearing robes which they give in two places, below the level and above the stomach. <coughs> tucking up their ample robes and letting the fold hang down. Thus, they have a great sack, as it were, around the body, in which they store away a thousand things. <coughs> Ear mothers put their children to fondle them and keep them warm. So that's probably, uh, see, there's a difference between what Champlain saw and uh, I how is engraver, of course, who is a Frenchman who, who never been in Canada, understood of what he described, <coughs> and how it was reinterpreted also by the by maybe a Champlain drawing and by the engraver. Uh, you see that we are like at three level from uh, the reality that that was there. There's another type of presentation of children uh, in still in this. Uh, uh, First Nation uh, team, if you want. It is the, the famous papoose. Huh? Uh, you see him there. You see him very improbable, but uh, anyway, he's there in the back. Huh? I don't know if you see. Ça marche? Ici, là. And uh, so it's a scene who, who have. Um, been uh, depicted uh, in a book by uh, a Jesuit priest who's called François Ducreux. And uh, the book was published in Latin, Historie Canadensis et Unove Franchier, Libri d'Echem, in 1666, so it's relatively uh, uh, early also. And he have few illustrations like this in his book who have nothing to do, I would say, with the text itself. Huh? But uh, these illustrations, because it's a Jesuit book and because it was published in France and all that, have an immense influence on the illustration. You will see, you will see other uh, examples. Okay, so he, he represents the, the papoose like this, like if the, the child was glued on, on a board and uh, we don't know how he can hold there, see? But anyway, he's, this, this is again the same problem that the people who, uh, who have not seen the things and and have only uh, literary type of, of uh, sources try to, to, to understand what, what it's all about. In the foreground, you have uh, uh, two women dealing with food. Uh, the one on the left uh, seems to be bouncing with a, with a stone on grain, probably uh, corn or something, and then uh, getting uh, flour from that. And the other one have a, a kind of mortar in which he could uh, also uh, grain greens. Uh, here, I think they have maybe uh, seen uh, some implement of, uh, that, uh, that were used by the Indian, but I've not understood how it works. Huh? The implement in question is the uh, mano and matate, like we say. It's a, it's a stone that you roll. You don't bounce it like, like, like he, he thought, you know. And the, the gesture he should have uh, represented is, is the one that you see on the right. Now. Uh, but since he, he, he doesn't know uh, how it was, he, he finished like that. For the, uh, for the other with, uh, uh, with the mortar, uh, I think the source there is evident. It's uh, from Champlain also. Uh, so all these engravers, uh, all these engravings, if you want, have sources in other engravings and all that. And we never had any uh, uh, direct contact with, with reality. No? And uh, in fact, the, the, the stick that she used seems so thin that we, we don't know how, how it will be so efficient. And uh, I put on the side uh, an illustration from Lewis Morgan to show you more of wh wh what they are trying to, to, to show here. Huh? And, uh, so the, the food and the, uh, 
and the preoccupation with children uh, who are uh, put there in their papoose, you will have more convincing uh, type of illustration of that, but much later. Uh, for instance, with uh, George Catlin, famous American artist, he will represent uh, really how, how we know more of wh what it was. Uh, uh, in, the, in one, it's a woman with her child in a cradle, Ojibwe, and the other uh, was supposed to be an Iroquois. Uh, he says that uh, the portrait of the Ojibwe woman with her child in his crib or cradle, the umbilicus hanging before the child face for its supernatural protector, the woman's dress was mostly made of civilized manufacture, but curiously decorated and ornamented according to Indian taste. Well, okay. But uh, so then you, you, you have to wait, uh, let's see, a few uh, centuries to, to get a more convincing type of illustration. But just to show you that the illustration of Ducreux were instrumental to, were influencing other things, I'll show you one page of the Codex Canadensis. Codex Canadensis is, is about <coughs> uh, 700, or uh, really the beginning of 18th century. This is the page 21 you see on the top there. And uh, there's many scenes, but the one who is more close to our subject is the one in, in the bottom, in which you see also a papoose. Huh? type of, of things in which the, the child seems to be in a little hammock uh, like this and uh, suspended uh, in midair. I don't know if it was such a good idea also with, with children to put them there. But uh, I thought, okay, this is original from <coughs> the Codex Canadensis. We don't know exactly the author of the Codex. Uh, the Codex goes with a huge book which is called Histoire naturelle des Indes occidentales. Uh, the Occidental Indies, because this is America. And uh, this was written probably by a Jesuit who's called uh, uh, Louis Nicolas. Uh, and maybe he made the drawing also, maybe he was helped by somebody we, don't, we really don't know. And uh, this representation of the child in a kind of little hammock, you find it again here uh, in Ducreux, uh, is here. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but the mother, sitting there have a kind of uh, thread uh, from her toes to the, uh, to the hammock, and so she can rock it a little bit like this to, to calm the child or something. Maybe he doesn't seem very secure there. They, they better tie him, and uh, I don't know. The, the two other women in front are inspired from Champlain. Uh, if you look at the two pictures on the top, on the right, you will see that he took his inspiration, the, the engraver there took his inspiration from the book of Champlain. Uh, uh, like I told you, it's always the same type of uh, approach uh, and uh, uh, say one, one engraver taking his uh, inspiration from another. Uh, and you will have, uh, even in Canada, let's say later, uh, the representation of more accurate, let's say, of uh, this uh, papoose. Here is a, a flathead woman and child, uh, Kawashan. These are people from the, in the west of Canada completely, and uh, done by Paul Kane. And what he was very intrigued by, by this because these people have the habit to uh, deform the, the head of children by putting them, see if you see she have a, a little plank above her head, and to get this type of profile, of course, it's probably exaggerated, but anyway, to tell, uh, to get the profile that the woman have there, you have to really deform uh, the, the skull. And uh, it was done like this slowly, and uh, apparently it doesn't change anything in the, in the let's see, the, the brain of people, I, I don't know. There's many cultures have done that. Uh, the Maya were, were certainly using this type of process. And uh, so, uh, but it was so intriguing, so bizarre and all that. So Cain made few pictures of this woman. This one uh, you can see here in the uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, then uh, an, an example will make a transition to, to what I will say after. It is a map, again, of uh, Father uh, Bressani, 
Giuseppe Bressani, is an Italian Jesuit who came to Canada. And uh, he made a, a map like, like to, they used to do with little vignettes here and there. But on the top, if you look uh, on the top and on the left, you have then representation of Christian Indian or converted Indian. Huh? And I, I will uh, just show you a, a close up of that in which uh, they have all their, um, all their gesture and the fact that they look at a cross, so it's a luminous cross, uh, make them, of course, part of the religious context that I was saying at the beginning. You remember I said that we, we uh, assist to a long process of secularization, except that here uh, it is uh, a, a kind of introduction to the uh, natives, to the religion. Uh, well, okay, their soul is Christian, but not their body. You see, they, they keep the same type of uh, clothing and this is always the, the problem with, with this uh, missionary work. They are uh, very enthusiastic to convert people, but they keep them as savage also. Uh, they, they kind of an ambiguity there. And here, in this case, the detail of costume are very, very, uh, very well painted. For instance, that she have a kind of plates on, on her uh, back, the, the woman there, uh, this has been described by many people at the time, see, like, like one of the ornaments that they were doing. And the man on the right have a t tobacco pouch on his back also. And this, this is uh, very, very well, uh, uh, well depicted and well seen, if you want. Huh? And uh, so, the, uh, so this is, I says it's kind of transition because now we will go uh, toward the uh, white children. Yeah. The first thing, of course, when you speak of white children, it is the, um, I, was, I said before, uh, this kind of uh, insistence on religious context. Uh, and uh, Father, uh, or Monsignor François de Montmorency Laval, have created a, a kind of devotion, if you want, who's called to the Holy Family and the Holy Angels. Uh, and uh, in the, uh, the text that present uh, the aim or the objective of this society, if you want, he, he, he tells the, the reason why he did that. He says, the aim and objective of this devotion is to give honor to the Holy Family and to the Holy Angels. The Holy Family being the model par excellence for all Christian families. It's a little bit strange. Huh? The, the Virgin was an uh, immaculate conception, and uh, Saint Joseph was just, <laughs> just a père nourricier, like you know, we used to say. Okay, anyway, Christian family. To sanctify marriage and families, to exclude sin from them, especially the sin of impurity, this curse of marriage, which is the source of so much evil, and which is responsible for so many children of Satan, both on earth and in hell, cursing their creator for eternity, to promote the Christian virtue of chastity, humility, sweetness, charity, the union of the heart, patience among tribulation and through devotion. Okay, so you see the, the, the intention behind that. It was proposed by the Jesuit and it was enthusiastically, uh, enthusiastically uh, taken by Bishop Laval. And so that means that the model of the first representation of children will be the Holy Family. Uh, and uh, there's one case who is, uh, I think, uh, rather touching, is this picture that uh, is at the Ursuline uh, Monastery in Quebec City, and uh, probably done by Claude uh, Francois, the, Le Frère Luc, uh, and in which you see the Holy Family, uh, Saint Joseph with his uh, lily, of course, because he's very pure, and uh, the, uh, the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus. But the girl who is there is a Huron girl. Uh, that's why they call it Holy Family with uh, a Huron girl. And we know that she's a converted one because if you see on her belt, she have a medal there. And uh, that was a way to, uh, um, to distinguish them, I would say. And what happened, of course, these children were taken from their family and brought in Quebec and uh, to different monastery or different uh, school. And uh, they were cut from their family. 
and they were raised like good Catholic, let's see, in this monastery. But uh, I always suspect that this theme of the Holy Family must have uh, appealed to their imagination. They lack their parents. Uh, the, 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 the mother and father is no more there. And, the, uh, and probably in their imagination, that was a kind of replacement. Uh, it's a little bit cruel to think that only an image could replace the real parents. But uh, more or less, I think that's what is, uh, is uh, expressed here. Uh, so, so you see the. Uh, you see right away the, uh, the theme of the Holy Family uh, is a way to depict children. The other theme, it is the, uh, the episode of uh, Jesus in the temple when he was 12. Uh, I have the quote here of uh, the gospel, let's see. Sometimes when I speak of this period, I feel like uh, being a vicar, you know, the, uh, quoting the Bible, but every year the parents of Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they went to the festival as usual. When the festival was over, they started back home, but the boy Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. His parents did not know this. They thought that he was with a group, so they traveled a whole day and started looking for him among their relatives and friends. They did not find him, so they went back to Jerusalem looking for him, on the third day, they found him in the temple, sitting with a Jewish teacher, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard this was amazed by his intelligence answers. His parents were astonished when they saw him, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done, us, uh, you done this to us? Your father and I will have been terribly worried trying to find you. He answered them, why did you have to look for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand his answer, no. If it was my son, I would have given a, a slang, but anyway. And uh, so this, this representation of, uh, of uh, Jesus adolescent, if you want, Jesus adolescent, is linked to this theme of the Jesus in the temple. Huh? And uh, of course, uh, Frère Luc, uh, that's why the gesture of course, he's there to teach and to, to answer questions. You have, of course, more famous representation of that with uh, uh, anger, uh, in which uh, you see on the right the mother coming and says, what are you doing? To, what, what, uh, and all these uh, wise people with books and all that uh, trying to, uh, to understand. And again, you have the same gesture pointing to, to heaven. In, in uh, French Canadian sculpture, let's say the theme is rare, but it, it, it exists. And you have uh, here a little relief done by Francois Bayarger, in which you see, uh, again, Jesus among the doctors, let's say, uh, discussing with them. Huh? <coughs> Third theme, the angel. And uh, again, with, with a Frère Luc, alors you see a young man with an angel, he doesn't seem to be too afraid, anyway, who point to the, to the heaven, where you see the name of God in Hebrew, but with a mistake in Hebrew. Yeah, the, it's, uh, he, he put a he, he put a het instead of a he. And, uh, but, okay. And uh, I don't know if, it's hard to see on this reproduction, but the child is close to a serpent. Huh? And uh, if I was the angel, I would have pointed down. Huh? So, yeah, be careful, the serpent. But uh, you no, know, he point to, to God and, uh, and the, uh, as if uh, nothing to worry about. And, and this uh, theme of the angel, of the guardian angel, becomes to take momentum in Europe when uh, we create college. Uh, why? Because in the college, people are, um, uh, the, uh, it's like a boarding place. You, you, you have to live there. And so you are surveyed all day by the, the, the teachers or the priests and the, uh, the attendant there. But you can, these people cannot survey their kids all the time. Uh, so the angels do the rest of the job. It's perfect especially in the night. And uh, the, 
the, the beginning of the obsession that you have already in the text of uh, Bishop Laval that I just wrote you with sexuality is again, it's, it's what is behind there. Huh? You need to, to teach these kids purity or uh, uh, by uh, telling them, well, you have a guardian angel near you all the time, so be careful, uh, behave. Huh? There's a, a wonderful uh, little conversation bit, uh, that is quoted by Erasmus. And uh, he says it's a student who's called Sophronius that is tempted to go to a prostitute who's called, um, I don't know, Lucretia, something like that. So he asks her, he says, if we do it, he says, did God, God we see us? She says, yes, of course, God see everything. And he says, but the angel will see us too? Uh, <laughs> as if it was, it was even worse. And uh, so they, they have... Uh, they certainly have uh, a link with, with, uh, with sexuality. Uh, and with the, like I told you, with the, with the context of the college uh, of the time. Uh, and, and this theme you will find, I think it comes again from uh, the Bible, but not from the Hebrew Bible. It comes from the, the story of Tobias. Uh, and uh, you remember it, it is the, the whole Tobit who sent his son to get some money from a friend. And um, he is accompanied on the road by uh, an angel that he doesn't recognize, of course, at the beginning. And uh, so you have um, one representation attributed to Frelick, where the angel is on the ground, is not floating in midair. And, uh, and again, with the, the same type of uh, presentation. And I put in parallel just a famous picture of uh, Antonio and Piero della Poluailo. Tobias and the angels, in which the angel holds a little box in which there's a liver of a fish that will heal the blindness of the father of Tobias. Huh? And, uh, and there's a very sweet little dog there on the bottom, uh, Fidelity, if you want. And they go like this. They seem to be two Renaissance uh, courtiers uh, going to, uh, in the middle of, uh, of nowhere. No? The, uh, there's one particularity, it seems, that I don't know, maybe some of you can check that, uh, that apparently when Catholic represent angel with, with children, uh, like if I go back, uh, like here, they are very close together. The, the angel touch the child very often. But it seems that in Protestant iconography, the angel doesn't, touch the child. And I hope in this case he have a wonderful power, you see, to, to protect his children, <laughs> not to fall in the, in the, in the abyss there. Uh, but uh, it seems that it's one of the, uh, and this is a chromolithography uh, done in England, and probably because of that, I think it's, it must be in a, in a Protestant uh, context. And uh, habitually, so the angel in this context don't touch the, the children. You see again, so this is a Dessayan, uh, the Richter, so uh, attributed to, we are not sure uh, of him, but a huge angel with big legs and all that is protecting this little girl. And, uh, and uh, we call it the ex voto of the guardian angel. Ex voto means that uh, the painting was done uh, to, uh, from a vow, uh, ex voto, from a vow. And uh, meaning that the people who had this painting uh, made were uh, wanting to make an offering to the church because they were saved from some problem of some uh, peril, let's say. And uh, so many, for instance, many captains of ship will do that. Uh, where when they were saved from, from the wreck, they will make a, an ex voto and they will give it to the Saint Anne de Beaupré, uh, where you have a little museum there and you see many of them. And uh, this maybe this child was saved from uh, sickness, I don't know what, but uh, th that was uh, probably the, the reason of this representation. And again, the, the, the angel always point to, the, to heaven. Uh, okay, then I want to show you, nevertheless, some uh, more, uh, I would say, down to earth type of people, but even then, you have, again, this uh, religious context as if it will take a lot of time to detach the representation of children from that. Here's an ex voto, uh, the same thing, of Madame Riverin. Uh, 
now we know a little bit more what could have been the reason of the ex voto. The husband of Madame Rivrain uh, suddenly disappeared and went to France and uh, never come back to Canada and left her hair with her kids. You see the four of them there. And the, probably she was in big mess. Uh, and then she decided to, uh, to make an ex voto to, uh, to uh, thanks uh, whoever helped her to, to get out from, from this mess. What is striking also, it's this kind of familiarity between, that's a Saint Anne that you see uh, appearing like that on a little cloud. I say Saint Anne because she have a book in her hand. Huh? And habitually, Saint Anne is represented with the virgin child and she's teaching him to read, uh, teaching her to read. Huh? So that's why the book habitually is a good sign of Saint Anne. Huh? So Madame Rivray is there with her four children uh, trying to, uh, to get some favor from, uh, from Saint Anne, who is uh, part of, uh, of the surrounding there without any problem. Huh? Just the, the clouds open, she descend and uh, she listen to them. We, oui, uh, pas de problème, <laughs> and then uh, go back to, uh, to, to heaven. Yeah? Another ex voto here and, uh, of Mademoiselle de Bécancourt. Alors, Bécancourt, c'est uh, Robineau de Bécancourt. This was one of the guys who was responsible of the, uh, all the, the roads uh, in, in New France at the time. Uh, 1675 also. So for a long time, this uh, painting was attributed to a man who's called Cardena, but uh, recent restoration have discovered a real uh, artist there, Jacques Galliot. And Galliot was a student of Frère Luc, so it makes sense. You see, it's all the same group of people. So what he shows is the little uh, uh, the Mademoiselle de Bécancourt on, on the right, and in front of her, the uh, Saint Anne with the Virgin. Uh, uh, she, she prayed to them. If the next voto, again, it, she was probably saved from some uh, problem, or maybe just a kind of recommendation. Habitually, the bourgeoisie was not too keen to show in the ex voto the problem from which they were saved. Uh, they just showed themselves, and they didn't want to uh, expose their uh, feebles, let's say, their limits. Uh, and so when you have a bourgeois type of, of representation like this, habitually, uh, we don't know exactly what happened. When it's captain of ship, of course, they show the ship uh, almost uh, sunk and things. Uh, they show you the, uh, what happened. Uh, and uh, this particular painting, I've suddenly, uh, uh, we, 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 uh, not me, but uh, uh, Robert de Rome, uh, find that, uh, a colleague from the UCAM. And uh, I found, uh, strangely, an influence if you compare the, the Virgin in the uh, ex voto with this painting, you will see it's exactly the same. Huh? He copied that from, to make here, the presentation of the Virgin to the temple. Huh? And uh, now, of course, the, the man who is presenting her is, is uh, Saint, Saint Joachim. But uh, let's see, again, it's a good example of uh, uh, the borrowing of one picture for, for doing another one. So you see, so what I meant at the beginning when I says the, uh, the uh, religious context is almost uh, the only way to get pictures of uh, children at this early stage. Uh, uh, what I want to do next time, it is to show you how we get, got rid of that slowly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to show you 19th century picture and also more modern one in which you would say finally the, the child will be, uh, 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 we will not need this justification of, of religion you see to be depicted. It could be then uh, uh, presented as such. Okay, you are very patient with me. I have a little bit of grip. Maybe you, you have uh, uh, noticed it. I'm sorry, but I will, I will be much better <laughs> next time. Okay, thank you.